Uh, good morning, everybody. Here with Dr. Uh, Marion Gale, of course, the Deputy Chief Health Officer in New South Wales, and also Sarah Gill, who is the Acting Chief Executive of uh, Breast Screen New South Wales. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, report that we had 863 locally acquired cases of COVID to 8 pm last night. Uh, that was out of uh, a very substantial number of tests, 132,279 tests. And I thank the community again for coming out in such great numbers uh, for testing. And we need to keep that up. Although we can see the end is getting closer, we're still in a situation where we need to be concerned about COVID across New South Wales. And uh, definitely, if you've got any symptoms at all, go and get tested. Vaccination rates are doing very well in New South Wales. Um, right across New South Wales, we have 85.7% uh, of the population over the age of 16 um, who have received a first dose of the vaccine. And 60.4% uh, um, are fully vaccinated. So again, thank you to the community who understands the need to be vaccinated in a pandemic. Um, the way out of this, the way to keep, keep your family, the way to keep you, the way to keep our community safe is to go and get vaccinated. Sadly, uh, we had uh, seven people pass away at 8 p.m. last night. There were four women and three men. On behalf of the government, on behalf of the community more broadly, and of course uh, New South Wales Health, I extend my condolences to each one of those people's families and their friends. It's um, very tough when we have anyone that's close to us passes away, and these families would now be suffering that, so we're thinking of you. Um, that takes us to 316 COVID-related deaths in New South Wales since the 16th of June. Um, and I want to emphasise again, I hear conversations now that uh, we don't need to get vaccinated. Well, yes, you do. You need to get vaccinated. You need to go and get vaccinated as quickly as possible. Uh, you're kidding yourself if you think you don't need to get vaccinated because it may well be you that uh, gets the virus and dies or ends up in a hospital ICU. It may be you that passes on the virus to your family or your friends and sees uh, the responsibility then fall upon your shoulders for the death of one of your close friends or family. You need to get vaccinated. Stop kidding yourself. You need to get vaccinated. Um, as life gets a little better, um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, one of the services I think that we we're all very concerned uh, had to be uh, wound back uh, to access more staff um, is now coming back online, and that is uh, Breast Screen, Breast Screen New South Wales. Um, there is nothing more important than having breast screen services available uh, for women to be able to make sure that uh, they are um, addressing those, uh, those concerns of cancer. Um, and uh, today, uh, Sarah McGill, uh, as I said, the, the Acting Chief Executive uh, of uh, the Cancer Institute will give us some commentary about that. Um, I want to also indicate some good news, um, some more good news, and that is that uh, uh, whilst we've currently got Byron, uh, Shire and Twee, the Twee in uh, lockdown, um, at the end of the seven day period, um, each one of those areas will be coming out of lockdown. So thank you to the community in those two areas who have uh, complied with the directions in regard to the lockdown. Um, and uh, thankfully we've had no uh, further cases of concern. Uh, and so the public health team have advised that uh, that they can uh, come out of lockdown. Um, I should indicate though that uh, the public health team is looking very closely at uh, three areas um, that might have to be, well are being considered bluntly for lockdown, um, but there's still a little more work to do. But I just, uh, um, I'll get Dr Gale to address those issues, but uh, um, Port Macquarie is one of those areas uh, Kempsey might have an extension, and Musselbrook um, is also being considered. 
as a result of cases in those areas. So these decisions are not made lightly. There's more work to do. Um, and the public health team will be doing that work this afternoon, but I'm just putting the community on notice that there may be a further announcement today in regard to all three of those areas or any one of those three areas. Um, we just need to make some final, uh, some final decisions on that. But in the meantime, my strong advice as Health Minister to all of the residents in those areas is to be very cautious where you're moving around at the moment and to certainly uh, go out and get vaccinated. What we do know, vaccinations uh, work. Vaccinations uh, keep people out of hospital and uh, hopefully not dying. Obviously, if you've got other um, underlying health issues, that can still be a challenge, a big challenge. But essentially, vaccines are what are saving the world from this pandemic. So please go and get vaccinated as quickly as you can in those areas. I'll ask uh, Dr Gale to uh, give us any more information and then we'll ask Sarah McGill to make some comments, commentary about the, uh, the resumption of breast screening services in New South Wales. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and good morning, everybody. Uh, in the 24 hours till 8 p.m. last night in New South Wales, we had 863 locally acquired cases of COVID-19 and two overseas acquired cases reported. As the minister said, we continue to see very good uh, consistent testing rates with over 130,000 COVID-19 tests reported till 8 p.m. last night. We're really pleased to see the vaccination rates continue to increase at the rate they are. And a big thank you to all of the community for taking up every opportunity to get vaccinated with the excellent vaccines that we have available to us. Um, and a reminder to anybody who hasn't yet uh, booked in for their first dose or who hasn't yet got their second dose to please do so uh, either through any of the New South Wales health uh, run clinics, your GPs uh, or a number of pharmacies as well that are available uh, with COVID-19 vaccines. So a big thank you to everybody, uh, to their wonderful efforts. And as we've said before, we really think that New South Wales can lead the world in our vaccine coverage and it's going to be such a critical part of our path going forward. So a big thank you and, and I do urge anyone who hasn't taken it up to please do so as soon as you can. Currently in hospital, we have 1,155 COVID-19 cases admitted. 213 people are in intensive care, of whom 113 are requiring ventilation. Of the 213 people in ICU, 160 are not vaccinated. 45 have received one dose of a COVID vaccine and eight people have received two doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. As the minister said, um, tragically today, we announced the deaths of seven people who have lost their lives to COVID-19, four women and three men. One person was in their 40s, one person in their 50s, two people in their 70s, two people in their 80s, and one person who was in their 90s. All of those individuals had underlying health conditions. One person was not vaccinated. Three people had received one dose of a COVID vaccine and three people had received two doses of a COVID vaccine. Um, and we do know that a number of those individuals who were vaccinated um, unfortunately had just received their COVID-19 vaccination uh, not long before acquiring their illness. So we know in a number of cases, unfortunately, the vaccine didn't have enough time to provide the protection uh, that we would have wanted. Three of those uh, individuals who passed away from, were from Western Sydney, two were from South Western Sydney, one person from Northern Sydney, and one person was from Dubbo. Uh, that gentleman from Dubbo uh, was in his 40s and he passed away at Dubbo Base Hospital. He was not vaccinated and had uh, underlying health conditions. Two of the people who died that we're announcing today acquired their infections in hospital. 
A woman in her 90s from Western Sydney acquired her infection at Nepean Hospital, and a woman in her 70s acquired her infection at Campbelltown Hospital. So I'd like to extend my sympathies, my sincere condolences to the families and the friends of those seven individuals who've passed away. Um, and we acknowledge that every time we announce these deaths, there is a uh, tragic stories behind it and families and friends um, who experience that pain. And so again, I encourage everybody out there um, to follow the public health orders, to please get vaccinated. We know that vaccines are highly effective at preventing hospitalizations and death. Uh, and so if you haven't already done so, um, please, please do book in for your vaccination. Finally, um, just to make some comments on areas of concern, uh, similar to the suburbs that we often draw attention to. And while we've seen some great improvements, particularly in the uptake of vaccinations, which is really terrific in these areas, um, and also some decreases in, ca in case numbers, we'd also like to still remind um, and ask the populations of the following suburbs to be extra vigilant. And they are people in Auburn, Punchbowl, Greenacre, Guildford, Bankstown, Penrith, Marylands, and Blacktown. I'd also like to particularly encourage residents of Wellington in Western New South Wales to be vigilant for symptoms. Please come forward for testing. Please get vaccinated. We are seeing increased numbers in Wellington. So if you live in Wellington, um, please be vigilant. Uh, and finally, as the minister said, we are uh, watching and looking at the situation very carefully in Port Macquarie, Musselbrook and Kempsey. And in all of those areas, we have had an increase in local cases uh, and people who have been infectious uh, in the community. So we are currently looking um, carefully at those situations and will be providing recommendations. So if you live in those areas, please be vigilant. Uh, come forward for testing. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As the Minister has said, I'm Sarah McGill and the Director of Breast Screen New South Wales. Breast Screen New South Wales provides free mammograms to women to detect breast cancers as early as possible before they can be seen or felt. Women who come to Breast Screen have no symptoms of breast cancer but come every two years to screen for signs of breast cancer. And as we know, that detecting it early means that you can have better health outcomes. Earlier in the pandemic, Breast Screen New South Wales made the very difficult decision to temporarily suspend screening. This decision was made in response to the increasing risk posed by the COVID-19 Delta strain and the need to redeploy staff to support the pandemic response at every local health district across the state. This e extra effort included vaccination, testing, support for the specialty health accommodation and relieving the frontline workers who needed to quarantine. I'm really pleased to advise today that we are now working towards resuming services across the state on a case-by-case, site-by-site location according to the level of risk and operational considerations posed by the COVID-19 Delta strain in every area. As the Minister has announced, we currently have a number of services in the Mid-North Coast, North Coast and Hunter New England local health districts already screening women, and we're working with other local health districts across the state to plan for reopening of services as soon as possible. The services that are now open include Coffs Harbour, Lismore, Port Macquarie, Tamworth, Narrabri, Scone, and we have mobile services in Kyogle, Casino and Grafton. Our priority with all services will be to rebook women as soon as we possibly can. Women who have had the appointment cancelled due to the temporary suspension will be contacted by the local service and allocated a prioritised booking. Breast Screen New South Wales has implemented a range of COVID-19 safe measures at its clinics and mobile screening services to protect women, staff and the wider community. It's really important to note that Breast Screen is a screening program for women with no symptoms. Women with symptoms of breast cancer should see their doctor as quickly as possible, 
These symptoms include a lump, changes to the breast, dimpling of the skin and any other changes in breast tissue that might not be normal for individual women. And we really need to impress on women, as we've been saying throughout the, the short-term suspension, if they have concerns about their um, breasts or any changes to their breasts, that they should get checked as a matter of urgency. Um, we're really looking forward to welcoming women back to breast screen services. The staff are, are really keen to ensure that services are available as soon as possible and working with their local health district to do so. So we look forward to that over the coming weeks and months as services are able to open. Thank you. Minister, can we start by asking about these two deaths in New South Wales Hospital? Um, what can you tell us about the details behind that? Two people go to hospital, catch COVID and die. Um, obviously extremely serious. Is there a fault? Is there liability? Is there compensation? Apart from the apologies that you've offered today? Um, across the world, it is well understood that uh, in a pandemic, there are always going to be risks for individuals no matter where they are. Um, hospitals, by definition, have people who come to them with COVID. And so there is always going to be that risk. But on the whole, uh, if one looks at those risk factors, clearly anybody who has um, any illnesses or any problems that require going to hospital should still go to hospital. Uh, it's been discussed many, many times. I'll find out whether Dr. Gar would like to add anything to that. So I can say um, for the person who passed away, um, at, uh, who acquired their infection at Nepean Hospital, um, that transmission is being actively looked into at the present time. We are aware um, across all hospitals in New South Wales, we have patients with COVID who are admitted. Um, and so how that person uh, acquired the infection uh, in hospital is being actively looked into and investigated at the current time. In relation to Campbelltown, we are aware that there are currently 17 patients who are infected um, in uh, at Campbelltown Hospital and three staff um, and one death associated uh, with that cluster at Campbelltown Hospital. And what we understand is that the index case or the initial positive person was transferred uh, from Liverpool Hospital where they uh, ac acquired their infection. So as the Minister said, in the context of a pandemic with a number of cases in the community, we know that our healthcare facilities are vulnerable to introductions of COVID, um, and that's why we have such an intense focus on vaccination of staff, of infection control procedures, um, of screening of visitors, screening of patients, screening of staff. Um, and a really important thing that as a community we can do is uh, to really get vaccinated um, so that we can protect our health system. But that's going to be an ongoing risk in Australia as it is globally to keep our healthcare facilities safe. In, a minute, in, a minute, in relation to this um, breast screen announcement. Sorry, just, just on that issue. Can I just finish by saying that uh, uh, clearly when any, any of us have our family members go into hospital, um, we want them to be well cared for and uh, it's awfully sad, it's terrible when somebody gets COVID in a hospital setting. Um, and to the families of those people, I'd just say, you know, our thoughts are with you. But we also do have to understand that in a pandemic, right across the world, hospitals are the places where people come with COVID. Um, so there's always a risk with this particular this Delta variant that it might be present. The hospitals do everything possible across New South Wales and across Australia. I know all of my uh, ministerial colleagues, Labor and Liberal around the country, all uh, suffer great anguish when we hear of uh, patients who have uh, contracted the virus in the hospital, in a hospital, and also passed away. But at the end of the day, that should not deter others from coming to hospital because if you are having a heart attack or a stroke or some other um, immediately uh, life-threatening illness, the place to be is a hospital because obviously you're not going to be doing too well if you're by yourself. The odds of getting um, the virus in a hospital are still very, very small. Um, and we do need to keep that in mind. I also think I need to just emphasise that it's very, very difficult with this particular virus 
We've talked about this for many, many months. Uh, you can be infectious without even having symptoms. Um, and so people can enter the hospital in all innocence um, to seek help. Staff can enter um, as well, but they can be, in fact, contagious. So it's, just, it's, it's an awful situation. It's just terrible. Um, and again, my sympathies to the families. I, it's an awful situation, but it's, it's what, uh, what the world has been dealt uh, with this Delta um, virus. Sorry, uh, go to James first, that's all right, we'll come to you. Hospitalisation is tracking a little bit under what you expect, and what got jumped yesterday. Now we've got breast screen coming back. We still have a bit of a peak, according to that Burnett moment, of hospitalisation and ICU. Are you still expecting the ICU demand to peak in mid October around that 947 mark, whatever it was? Or is it looking better than what was initially projected? I think the first thing to say is that modelling depends on the inputs and the modellers, the expert epidemiologists that uh, put together these models, um, look at a variety of data and determine what data they're going to put into their models. I very well remember in about March or April last year uh, being in the health building and having a model put to me based on data input, which was the only real data available at the time, from Europe and the forecast was that in New South Wales we would have 25,000 people die by Christmas last year. I think that emphasises that modelling has a place but it also needs to be considered in the context of what data is available, what data is going in, what are the inputs and of course uh, the one thing that we know is that our community in New South Wales is leading the country. Uh, in terms of being prepared to go and get vaccinated. So those vaccinations are making a difference to the modelling. And I think what we're seeing now is uh, at, least a hope, at least a hope that we may not get um, as much pressure as we thought on our hospital system. But that's by no means clear yet, uh, James. I think the, the, the pro approach that I have as health minister and certainly with the health, senior health staff is we're still taking a precautionary approach. Um, we have to expect, but hope that it doesn't happen, that the uh, the numbers will increase again over the next month. But we're hoping it doesn't happen. Minister, Ursula. Minister, there's a lot of there's a lot of anger at regional areas that currently aren't in lockdown uh, that they're going to have those restrictions imposed upon them when we hit 70 percent. So October 11th. Um, why was that decision make and, uh, made and do you understand that there, there's a lot of anger that they say that they haven't had the supply that they need so they've been left behind, that yes. they're going to be punished? Every part of New South Wales, every community needs to understand there's only one path out of this and that is vaccinations. And as we have made those decisions about how we try to bring our entire state out, um, there have been some difficult decisions and I think the community need to understand that uh, Nothing is perfect in a pandemic. It, it never has been. The decisions that have been made have been made in the best interest of the bulk of the community, the majority of the community, and uh, certainly the crisis cabinet and the health, public health units that gave us the advice looked at all those issues. Sorry, I'll go to you first and then you, Lucy. Yeah. Since the roadmap was released yesterday, Minister, mm. um, there's been a lot of spirited uh, commentary, uh, in particular around the decision to announce when unvaccinated people will be able to join the party, so to speak. What, what's your thoughts around that commentary? Look, I've stood in these press conferences now more than 500 times, um, and what I remember very well is that one part of the room will be arguing one thing, one part of the room will be arguing the other. Um, you've got to expect that that reflects the community. Journalists reflect the community. The community have a variety of views. But at the end of the day, the decisions that the government has taken right along, and I might add, I think each of the other governments, so whilst we may not always agree with them, the governments around the country have done their very best to try and make decisions to balance the interests of the community. Nothing's going to be perfect, but everybody makes those decisions in their own jurisdiction. We've made ours, uh, and we're sticking to it. Minister, just, uh, just further to Ursula's question on, on the region. So as to supply, what do you say to, to those areas that, that still say they haven't had the same access to vaccine and are still struggling to, to find jobs in the same way that, that perhaps we've had it in the metropolitan area? Oh, look, I, I have sympathy with that view um, because 
we have had, uh, as each one of you know, I don't think there's a journalist in the room who hasn't been at probably a couple of hundred of these press conferences at least, and one of the frustrations has always been the challenge to get a uh, vaccine available from overseas providers. The federal government has done their best in my view, but it has been a challenge and it's remained a challenge. Um, but right now, right now, there is more vaccine available in this country than we could have probably dreamed of actually, and more access across New South Wales uh, than we had dared dream, dream, dream of uh, only a few months ago. Pharmacists all across the state have Moderna. There's Pfizer available through the hubs um, and through some GPs. There's AstraZeneca that's been available for a long while. I think that uh, in some areas uh, there've been some challenges of getting the vaccines, but there have generally been availability of at least one of the vaccines. But uh, there's been a little bit of pickiness and choosiness about that. Um, I think uh, in the way that uh, I would encourage the community just to understand that when you're going to be a flu shot, you don't ask what brand it is, we never have. Um, just go and have the vaccine that's available because whatever vaccine is available is the best vaccine that is going to keep you safe. Minister, just on the December 1 day, like, have, we lost, have we lost people? Have, have we had cancellations overnight of, of people who might have booked in and thought, you know what, I think that what needs to be remembered is that there are many, many businesses who will actually be making it very clear that as at December 1, if you haven't been vaccinated, you won't be welcome. And I think the airlines have made that very clear. Uh, there are a lot of other businesses who are saying the same thing. And I think uh, people need to understand that uh, um, a balancing act had to be struck, but at the end of the day, if you haven't been vaccinated by 1 December, you're going to find that you still will have a lot more limited opportunities in the places you want to go. Uh, so really, just go and get vaccinated and stop, stop hesitating, stop uh, finding reasons not to do it. Unless you, there's only one, uh, one basic reason why you shouldn't be getting vaccinated, and that is if you have a medical contraindication. If you don't have that, you should be getting vaccinated. Minister, 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 Minister. Sorry. Um, Um, the rules have been enforced. They continue to be enforced. I haven't heard the police commissioner's comments. But if the law says that you have to be double vaccinated, then of course the police will enforce that. They have no choice but to enforce that. Um, and they have done a, a remarkable job to date uh, enforcing it. It's been a balancing act for them too. I mean, if you think about the fact that uh, in the last hundred years, police officers really haven't had to go out and uh, deal with health orders. Um, in fact, thankfully, none of us have had to, um, with the exception of one rare moment. Uh, but basically, this is, this is a new event, once in a hundred years. I think our police have done a remarkable job trying to find the balance. Um, and, you know, you could pick on individual cases and say, well, they could have done it this way or that way. But overall, I thank the police for the work they've done. And, I, and I'm sure that they will enforce the public health orders as required. Well, that's a different issue, Liz. That's a different issue. It is going to be left up to the businesses individually. Is it unfair to say that people who are doubly vaccinated, of course, have certain rights laid down under the roadmap for it. Um, people who are not doubly vaccinated will not have those rights, and particularly in relation to hospitality for a long while. And uh, that's by government order. In addition, businesses will be able to make their own decision whether they want to have the risk of having people in their property when they're not vaccinated. So I'm quite confident that uh, in terms of enforcement of the law, the police will enforce those orders. But the minister, James. The Cops Which are, minister, sorry? Sorry, the commissioner, rather. The commissioner has said that the cops are going to check on health businesses to enforce them, but you're still going to have the you know, publicans having argued with an anti vaxxers trying to get to the pub. Are you not worried about that? I'm quite confident that the orders, any orders, any laws, will be enforced by the police. It's their job. 
Um, so they will actually do their job, and I'm sure the Commissioner will make sure that they do. And how do you envisage businesses? Um... But can I say also, I mean, this is the sort of minutiae or, or detail that seems to preoccupy some sections, yes, some sections of the yes, community, yes, and particularly journalists. But hang on, hang on, James, I'm talking at the moment. Just let me finish, please. And what I would say is that the bottom line is we all have an obligation. Each one of us have an obligation to our fellows, to our uh, the rest of our community, to be safe and to not spread the disease. It is quite simple. Go and get vaccinated. But Minister, there's also both Sorry, um, I think this will. Was Yeah, but I've answered that, that I think that uh, the police will enforce it if the person is not actually doing what they should be doing under the public health orders. It's not a great position for a business owner to be in, though. Are you concerned about that? Do you, do you... Of course I'm concerned, but I'm telling you that if there are public health orders, it's a crime not to comply. So the police will enforce those orders. There are there are other there are other methods of, of checking. We, we've had other enforcement, liquor and gaming, and so on, have been out enforcing those issues all the way along the line. I don't think the police should be at the forefront of this at all. I think the police are more likely to be called in to actually deal with situations that will need to be dealt with, and that's an entirely normal occurrence. Will a business be fine, Minister? Will a business be fine if someone who is unvaccinated that comes into their premises? At this stage, that's not part of the public health orders, so I don't think that is uh, likely. But look, everything so is under review. The, what will be the punishment for an individual who is unvaccinated going into a venue and the punishment for the venue allowing that to happen? The fine, no, I just said that the venue is unlikely at this point to be fine. That's not on the agenda at this point. Um, and I don't think any state or territory are moving in that direction at the present time. But individuals are up for fines from somewhere between 1000 and potentially $11,000 and or six months in jail if they breach the orders. If they go to court, that's the potential fine. If the business is not going to be fine, then why would they have a fight with someone who is unvaccinated? Well, James, because if you're a business uh, and you're doing your job to make sure that somebody's coming in who is actually complying with the law, then I'm sure they do that for their patrons to make sure all their patrons stay safe. Minister, just on yeah, to um, the vaccine mandate for health workers that kicks in on Thursday, mm. um, are you looking, is it looking like you are going to have to provide any sort of exemptions or broad extensions for local health districts where they don't have a sufficient health worker vaccination status yet in time for Thursday? Look, overall, I think we're up to about 94% of uh, first vaccines for the health uh, workers across the state. They've really responded amazingly well, as you'd expect, because um, health workers understand the need to protect uh, their colleagues that they work with. They need the under, they need or they, they understand that their obligation is to protect their patients, um, and they have been amazing. And I want to thank all our health workers who've not only been keeping us safe during the pandemic, but have also uh, um, gone out in great numbers to get vaccinated. Yes, so, in some areas, like hang, hang on, Lucy, please. No, 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 no. Um, if there are individual small areas that have particular challenges, uh, they need to understand, that is the individuals involved, that they also have that obligation. They have the obligation to their staff, to their colleagues, they have an obligation to their patients, and they should go and get vaccinated. This is no time to be precious or selfish. Get vaccinated. Minister, hang, on, hang, on, hang on, can I just finish answering Lucy's question? Sir? And let me make it very clear that those orders are there for a reason. And if there are challenges in individual areas, then we will address those challenges um, but it won't be with those staff who are causing the uh, problems. It'll be with part of the network of our, our system. It's a vast system. It's the biggest health system in the country by a long shot, 140,000 staff. And if individuals don't want to be there, if they want to put their, their patients and their colleagues at risk, well, they won't have a position. Minister, um, Minister what's, the, what's the plan going forward on the disaster payments for businesses? have been receiving those payments throughout this pandemic. What will happen once we hit 8 per cent? Will they still be entitled to receive those? Do you know any details? You'll have to address that issue to my Treasurer colleague when he's available, because that's not an issue that I'm directly involved in. Minister, Minister right. I'd like to ask, Sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. um, when is Parliament going to be returning? Is that at 8 per cent? And also protests, is that from uh, December 1? Is that when they'll be allowed to return? Um, 
let's deal with Parliament. Parliament, I think the discussions are taking place at the moment. The last I heard was it was likely to commence, I think it's in the second week of October. Um, and I think the Speaker and the various uh, committees that are looking at that are trying to ensure that all the MPs who return are there uh, vaccinated um, and in uh, lesser numbers than normal, obviously, because of the, uh, the general requirement more broadly that is part of what you've all seen with the four square metre rule. What's, what's happening James. with rapid antigen tests? They'll be allowed in the home in November 1, Minister, your counterpart has said. Um, what's New South Wales? The Federal Minister. Yes, the Federal uh, Minister. Mm -hmm. um, how is New South Wales going to use rapid antigen tests? Where are they going to be used? Um, how are you going to collect the results? What's going to happen there? Look, that, those announcements have only just recently come from the federal government, and obviously the issue has been around the uh, the um, TGA's view that the limits have been around the fact that the uh, rapid antigen testing um, had to be done under clinical supervision. Uh, that's been something which has been uh, somewhat of an annoyance and 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 getting in the way of a practical usage of those rapid antigen tests um, in a range of circumstances. In overseas jurisdictions, rapid antigen tests are used much more freely. Um, now that it would appear that we are going to have a more free approach to the use of those rapid, jet, rapid antigen testing, the government and the crisis cabinet will be able to make decisions about that after we get appropriate. Minister, just, just after we get appropriate medical advice. Just please don't. Please, one at a time. It's not as if I'm not not rushing away. Just one at a time. Just yes, I'll come back to you. Yep. Just, just back to my question about protests. Are they going to be allowed to resume in December? Look, I think uh, the issue would be um, will be considered by the government, but I don't think there's any one of us on either side of politics who are anti the democratic process. Most of us uh, respect and understand uh, the democratic process, provided it's done in a peaceful way, which is not what we saw in Victoria, of course. Um, and we'd like to see the opportunity for people to be able to uh, make their applications in the, in the usual way to the police uh, and to have approval for democratic expression of your viewpoint. Um, it's likely that one would think that when we get to the, uh, to the period where, where unvaccinated people will be able to have certain entitlements that it would be, but it hasn't been determined yet. When the Liz, sorry, sorry, Liz. The last, the last two days <coughs> have been, um, we've been on par personally with Victoria in terms of case numbers. Is it now time to remove all you know, travel restrictions that we've got on the Victorian border and, and just let the two states work through? Uh, well, New South Wales, as you'd know, has never, uh, sorry, let me finish, let me finish, have never put in restrictions um, except when things got really challenging in Victoria. But at the moment, obviously, there are certain um, aspects as a result of the Victorian situation that are driven by the Victorian government. Um, I think uh, we just need to understand a little more, or not we, but the, the, the Victorian government needs to understand a little more of how that's being managed before any decisions are made by the Victorian government. But, I can't tell you what the Victorian government will or won't do, but as I've said many times, I respect their view, their position. They're doing what they consider to be appropriate, um, and we'll hear from them in due course. And the so the vaccination rates in the east of the city um, are substantially lower than the rest of the state's average at the moment. What's causing that disparity, and what are we doing to fix that? Um, look, there are pockets, obviously, where there are um, less less take up in vaccines, not just in the eastern part of Sydney, but other parts as well. And uh, the availability of um, vaccines is certainly one of the issues we talked about before. Um, but the health, the health uh, um, team have done everything they can to get the messages out to each of these communities to try and ensure they understand the need to be vaccinated. Um, they've obviously ensured that there are, um, in addition to the GPs, there are pharmacists who are available with vaccines to make that as readily available as possible. Um, in some areas what we found is that uh, there's uh, people who perhaps don't have uh, access to public transport um, and can't get to these various venues. So when we do that, there's been a lot of pop-ups uh, and there's a whole range of activities that are currently being undertaken by New South Wales Health to try and encourage people in all of those areas. Lucy, Lucy. Terry Chan yesterday said that um, you were still at the drawing board on aged care visits, but one of the things she sort of floated was perhaps keeping unvaccinated children under the age of 12 out of facilities maybe. Can you talk us through where your heads are at on, on aged care visits and the settings that are going to be required? Yeah, as I, I think I said a couple of days ago that I think uh, um, each of us share the view that we should be able to visit 
uh, aged care relatives and friends in aged care facilities as soon as, is, as it is safe to do so. Um, and the challenge is how do we do that? Uh, certainly, I know there have been discussions as late as this morning between our senior health officials and federal officials about how we might achieve a, uh, an agreed position between the federal government and the state government. But I can indicate that certainly from the New South Wales point of view, we want to move as quickly as possible to get uh, visitors back into aged care facilities where it is safe to do so. Um, it may be that, uh, uh, and there's no guarantee on this at this point, but we're talking about the possibility anyway of um, at the same time as five visitors can come into our own homes, that aged care facilities might be on the same time frame because obviously that's people's homes. So whether or not it's five people, it's probably far less than that at, that at that stage. But we're working through those issues between the Commonwealth and the state and trying to come up with an agreed uh, arrangement. Uh, Dr Chance's concern about young children, of course, is that um, youngsters, 12 and under, can't be vaccinated. And so uh, if the requirement were that someone coming into an aged care facility was doubly vaccinated, which it will be, it definitely will be, uh, when, when that decision is made, there's no doubt about that one, um, then uh, it presents challenges for youngsters coming in. So what, what Dr Chant and her team are looking at currently are what other measures that might be something the Commonwealth and the states could agree on. Uh, it, might, it, could, it could involve, for example, children um, being uh, outside, having outside visits. But even that presents some difficulties because some older folks in, um, in aged care facilities can't get out of the facility into, say, the garden area. So all those issues are being talked through at the present time, as you'd expect us to do, but it's, uh, it's with a great deal of passion and energy because we all want um, to have visits back into aged care facilities as soon as possible. Can I ask a talk about rat, rat tests? Yeah. Um, so when they are used in, in home settings, uh, is the New South Wales government still of the view that you want to record every single test, or when they're used just as broad surveillance tools in the home, not under supervision, will we not... Depends on, it depends on the purpose, James, but yes. as my voice is starting to get a bit... <laughs> Uh, anxious, I can hear. I'm in the sense of my throat. I'm going to ask Dr. Gale to answer something just for a second while I have, if I can find a glass of water. Oh, Dr. Gale. No, I can't. Yeah, so I guess I'm just asking, like, would New South Wales be happy to not have every single test of the reported um, maybe miss a couple of positive tests when we're at that stage where we're using rat tests? Yeah, thank you. Look, I think with the um, announcement that rat tests are going to be more broadly available and available for home testing, we, we welcome that. I think, you know, it's clearly great to have more tools in the toolkit about options for testing um, and we'll be looking at the best ways to deploy that, uh, that new modality that can be used more flexibly. And the issue of how to report those tests will also be part of those considerations. I think we have to be practical that if they're going to be tests that are available to be purchased by individuals and, and potentially by, you know, available in the home, that that may be operationally challenging about how we're going to actually get the results for all of those things. So um, we'll be looking at those issues and, and looking at what practical settings actually make sense as we go forward in a setting where we have to treat COVID like an endemic disease, more like flu, more like other respiratory conditions into the future. So those are all issues that we'll be looking at um, and thinking around how we can best use uh, rapid antigen testing with the new conditions around it as part of a toolkit of a number of other measures to make sure that we are looking to test the right group of patients, of people in the right settings at the right time. Thanks, everyone. Oh, sorry, can I just go a question to Sarah? Sarah, you've got a couple of Great news that the breast screening operation is coming back in a phased way, but can you give us any indication of what your fears were for when it was closed down? How many patients that might have gone slipped through the net, through the cracks, and not been discovered? Uh, how many potential uh, cases we have, potentially even deaths we've had in that uh, period? Mm, that's a, thank you for that question. It's a very good question. I think the service. Uh, was very concerned um, and didn't make the decision to close services lightly. As you'll be aware, we closed services for a short period of time when the pandemic started last year, and we've been looking very closely at what occurred at that point. 
and um, we're very pleased to report there was a very little impact um, from the closure of service at that stage and women returned very quickly and promptly to breast screen services which we were really thrilled about. So we're expecting the same thing to happen this time as services open and um, staff and, and women will be safe to return. We expect that women will come back very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you.